I would say if the authorities didn't want us involved in the public square, they ought not to have crucified Jesus in the public square. Use humanistic principles. Well, I would say the same idea. I would say that. Same end. I would say, what's the problem with stardust bumping into stardust? In the in the cosmic picture, no, there's no problem. In the oh, cosmic right. picture, it won't matter. No, Mr. President, you are not protecting reproductive freedom. You are authorizing the destruction of freedom for one million little human beings every year. I'm sorry, my friends, but I am tired of seeing Jesus presented as a weak beggar. He is a powerful Savior, and the gospel is not a suggestion, it is a command. Reverend Mola, don't you sympathize with that? I sympathize with every single human heart wishing to know the one true and living God, but I believe there's only one way that that can happen through Jesus Christ, and the gospel is about repenting of sin, not celebrating it. Right now, you're on the threshold of an amazing adventure. We will explore the spiritual abyss. You have not experienced this before. You're gonna love it. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. Carmen, mute your microphone. Yeah, what's happening in the background? Here? Yeah, I got you. I got. I got. I can hear myself talking in the background. Trying to figure out what's going That's on. That's right. Hey, uh, so we're back now. Apologia Radio. Very excited about this particular episode. I am actually very, very excited about this episode. That is uh, over there, Luke the Bear. What up? Hey, wait. Actually, you know what? That actually may be, that might be my you. fault. That's it, what I was wondering if you're is. playing something else. That's what it is. I had it in the background. I apologize to everyone who's listening right now. You're like hearing double stuff. Just hang with us. We fixed it. It's okay? not double speak. No, it's it's good to go. We got it. Okay, so I am Jeff. They call me the Ninja. Poor That's Carmen. Luke the Bear. I know. Hi, Carmen, I have to offer you my sincerest apologies. I just blamed you for something that was my fault. Carmen. But still keep your microphone muted. Yeah, but still, you stay quiet over there. <laughs> In <our> tech room. <laughs> That's Luke uh, the Bear. Hi again for the third time. That's Zach Zach. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, Director of Communications for End Abortion Now. Go to endabortionnow.com to get more information. Encourage all of you guys to go to endabortionnow.com. Get connected with your local church. We have now about 300 local churches globally. That is all over this planet who are working together to engage the culture of death, the issue of abortion with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about pro-life movement stuff, neutrality, that sort of thing. We're talking about Christians engaging this as the church, engaging the world around them with the message of Jesus mm -hmm. in the area of abortion. And, and through your efforts together with us as a church, all of your work together, praying for us, giving towards this ministry. Not only have you helped to create this movement, uh, but you have uh, been God's means to actually raise up these ministries to save now. And there's no way to calculate it now. All we can say now is thousands. Thousands of lives have been saved. Children who are alive today because of you partnering with us and making this possible. If you go to my Facebook page, you can actually see a picture we just posted. Uh, two pictures yesterday. Two pictures yesterday I posted. Uh, babies who are alive today because mm. of your efforts. Uh, End Abortion Now 2019 is going to be hectic and big and crazy and amazing <laughs> and we are so excited but it's going to be difficult and we need you please join yep. together with us we need churches to be in this fight with us we have a very unique thing that we're doing next year for 2019 that we just didn't have the ability to do yet um and now we do mm -hmm. uh we're going to be talking more about that over the next couple of weeks on apologia's platforms but we are going to be doing a lot of things for the glory of god and for the sake of these babies and uh, which includes raising up your church to, to create a media ministry yep. like this to engage the issue of abortion the culture of death and to work together to speak as the church prophetically 
that is with the word of God to your local magistrates, calling them to repentance, calling them to uphold justice. So big things in store for 2019. You can partner with us right now. Please do. We need you so desperately to make this Mm -hmm. happen. And what we're doing it for in terms of financially is a fraction that's not even fair to call it a fraction, I think, in terms of what the pro-life movement uh, raises every year yeah, in the right. tens of millions of dollars yeah. globally and each individual organization to not even do near what God does through his church. Amen. Can I say that? And, and I'm, I'm, there's no glory in that for us. It's him. Mm-hmm. It's right. his glory. It's what he does with his church. It's mustard seeds that become large trees. That's what he does. And so we need your help. If you would, go to endabortionnow.com and you can give there. Um, I am fully confident in all that God is doing That's through End Abortion Now. Is it? With faith. <laughs> with faith. Confide. <laughs> yeah. With faith. Com- I'm fully confident in what God is doing through End Abortion Now, through your labor with us, and through your giving. Um, we have been faithful with that giving. We have stretched it like you cannot even imagine. And uh, we've been able to use it to raise up a force of Christians that are going to end abortion. Amen. Oh, amen. You can take that to the bank. And I know it's going to happen because it's doing it through God's word in the gospel. No neutrality. What is up? We are back. I'm excited. This is a very important episode. We're going to be talking about um, somebody that I really love and respect, Ben Shapiro, and another brother in Christ, uh, 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 Dr. John MacArthur. Uh, who had a conversation with Shapiro, and we're going to be talking, uh, piggybacking basically off of what we did last week. The conversation that MacArthur and Shapiro had was actually a, a good conversation. Oh, yeah. There yeah. were some areas of you know disagreement that we have with Brother MacArthur, and, and you know we, we're excited, we're thankful to God for having that conversation having happened yes. and how MacArthur yep. handled it. Uh, there are just some areas that we think are vitally important to get right that. Um, related to MacArthur's eschatology and some other issues, um, actually helped sort of feed Shapiro's rejection of Jesus. Mm. And we don't want to give any of that to an Orthodox Jew or to a Jew who rejects Jesus. We want to actually stick to the Scriptures, allow the Word of God to speak there, so we can actually lead those Jews to Jesus by the grace of God. Hey, um, Mm. so before we get into it, though, I do want to talk about um, a news article. Let's 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 do that because yeah, because we I want to. It's so good. It's so important. <laughs> we just have to do it. Okay. Do you have it pulled up? Yeah, I guess okay. the background music. Yeah. I, no, I don't have it. I thought you had it. Oh no, I just read the title. But we can. Uh, we'll talk about it anyway. Yeah, we don't need the. So it's all over the news right now. Some of you guys have probably already seen it. Um, the uh, boy scouts. The let me say that again. The boy. Scouts. It's in the name. It's yeah, in the right. name, y'all. Boy Scouts. <laughs> Boy Scouts. All right. And I, I don't uh, even know. What, I don't even know how else to do this. It's in the name, Boy Scouts. Right. Do you remember yep. that Shapiro took a question from someone at a, a the university once, and she Did said, he? "Well, who's who's to say it's called uh, Boy Scouts?" And he goes, "Well, it's in the name. <laughs> it's in Boy the Scouts. name." <laughs> Speaking of him, I see the Daily Wire is watching right now. Are they really? Oh, well, what's, what's up, up? Daily Wire? Uh, we love you guys. Um, yeah, we've had Shapiro on. Uh, I love Shapiro. I'm very thankful for a lot of stuff that he does in terms of engaging the culture um, with some just sanity and logic. Um, we had Shapiro on to talk about the issue of abortion. Um, hey, Daily Wire, can we do this? Um, you know us. We know you. Uh, we love Shapiro. Can we organize something where I get to sit down with Shapiro like yes. MacArthur did? I, I, we will pay for everything. All right, we'll, we'll get the flights out. We'll take care of all that stuff. I'd love to sit down and sit down with um, Shapiro just to have a different kind of Christian perspective. Mm-hmm. I would say, and I don't mean this in any way offensive to Brother MacArthur, I would say a more Orthodox Christian perspective in terms of how Christians would have responded to some, to some of these questions in history, in particular some of the Puritans, um, the you know Reformers, mm-hmm. uh, just a little bit different. I think we a little more helpful. And I'd love to talk to Shapiro about this issue of Jesus as Messiah. Let's make that happen with your audience and our audience. I think it would be massive. Daily Wire, let's make it happen. You know that I love Ben. You know that we are respectful with Ben. We care about Ben a, a ton, and uh, we actually really appreciate a lot that he does. Yes. Let's make it happen. Sure. I think with our two audiences together, it would be really, really good. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, back to the thing. So you have Girl Scouts. It's in the name, who, y'all. Who, who apparently give half their money to Boy the murder of girls in the womb. Right. Unfortunately. Boy yeah. Scouts. It's in the name, y'all. Like gender distinctions, right? Like obvious stuff. So as it's not they Scouts. Right. So as the Boy Scouts <laughs> gets Scouts. woke, as the Boy Scouts gets woke, 
the Boy Scouts gets broke. broke. Boy Scouts gets woke. Boy Scouts gets broke, right? And that's what happened. It's all over the news right now. The Boy Scouts woke is suffering. Is woke is broke, y'all. <laughs> uh, the Boy Scouts is 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 suffering, and they're you know going into bankruptcy now. Why? Because everyone's leaving the Boy Scouts. Why? Because the Boy Scouts is adopting all of this this liberal propaganda and all of this really distortion of human sexuality and gender distinctions and those sorts of things. And so with that, woke is broke, y'all. Hashtag it, y'all. Woke is broke. Woke, Woke is broke. broke. Yep. And uh, it, it should be so patently obvious. We just had a great conversation with our brother, um, uh, our, our little brother radio program. Yeah. Our little brother radio program. Oh, that's so cute. Isn't cross it? politics. So brother Toby. Um, our boys over there, cross politics, love them. Uh, Toby Sumter, amazing <laughs> conversation we have with Toby on this whole issue of gender, gender straight distinctions. Fire. It was straight fire. It's, it's going to be on Apologia All Access. You can get that at apologiastudios.com. Let me tell you what, you need to hear that episode. It'll probably be up in about a week or no, maybe by the end of the month. It's Christmas time, y'all. Things slow down here a bit. We take that pretty seriously. We here. take it very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, Toby Sumter, just in terms of like, I love what he said. Don't you guys love the part where Toby was saying like, sin is boring. Yeah. Sin is boring. The way the world distorts sexuality, the image of God, gender distinctions, it's boring. So it's being, ugly. Being robbed of glory. Yeah, robbed of glory. Like the, the whole thing we talked about of, of Celine Dion and her stupid clothing line. I mean, come <laughs> on. Goes into the, um, the, 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 you know, newborn area and she sprinkles, you know, stupid dust Black on babies dust, yeah. and uh and she you know spreads it on the babies and all of a sudden they go from like pink and blue to like drab really gray stupid looking clothing it's so boring and so ugly let's be honest sin is just dumb right. and um and that's it, and that's just stupid i mean when you rob a girl of the glory of being a girl and and i love what toby said said there it's like when 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 um, uh, who's the dude? Who's the dude? That, uh, Jenner. Uh, Jenner. When Bruce Jenner um, cuts off his tallywhacker and he says, "I'm a lady," um, <laughs> Toby says that's basically like just a huge middle finger to women everywhere. Like you know, you're being a woman is not very special. It's not not amazing. It's not glorious. All I have to do is just cut off this appendage, and I have all of your beauty and all of your glory. It's like, yeah, come on, what a it's, mockery of women. It's man. what a mockery of of what it means to be a lady and a woman and the glory of a woman. So hey, welcome back. This is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you do a radio show after talking to Toby. No, just, I love what he said. That edge is strong. I love what he said about you know how the the unbelievers they worship the created things rather than yeah. the Creator who made us. And you know if you're an unbeliever, you have a perspective that essentially everything came from nothing, right? Mm. Like that's the perspective. So in your worldview, if everything that exists can come from nothing. Well, I guess something can become anything else right. too, and yeah. that's what you have with transgender mania. That's what you have with abortion, um, you know, homosexuality. All of this stuff. There's distinctions that God has put in the world, and it makes us dumb when we try not to live like it's true. Right. Like that's what it does to us. Mm. It destroys right. us, but it also makes us dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you guys who are watching right now on the live feed. Appreciate all of you guys and uh, encouraged by many of you guys. Um, uh, uh, flat earthers, stop embarrassing Christianity and yeah, go I ahead see. and get out of our feed. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that with all the love and grace that's that's within me. Um, you're, uh, can I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take a tangent here real fast. <laughs> We're having a discussion here talking about leading Jewish people to Jesus Christ. And when you troll a feed where we're trying to reach Jews for Jesus to talk about flat earth stuff, you show your idolatry. Mm. You show mm. your idolatry that, that this particular scheme is more important to you than leading Jews to Jesus, the topic of discussion today. We're talking about proper dis gender distinctions and roles, you know, like actual real stuff, important stuff. And when you take over a feed to talk about flat earth, you show, you show your idolatry. So I would say repent of your idolatry and uh, get on board with, you know, like really important stuff for the glory of God and for Jesus' yeah. kingdom. Okay. Um, Amen. On that note. <laughs> uh, so Ben the Baptist says, hey, Jeff Dirt Ben, you're a Calvinist heretic. Hey, Ben the Baptist. Hey, Carmen, bounce that guy. Hey, Ben the Baptist, why don't you uh, come on the radio program and let's let's talk about uh, that, that discussion of Calvinism. I'd love to discuss that with you, Ben the Baptist. Let's organize it. So rather than trolling in the, in the feed here, let's make a conversation happen on the radio program 
live. I think that would be important to do. And uh, Ben the Baptist. He already yeah. said that Calvinism is a doctor of devils. Okay. Yeah. That's how he introduced himself uh, into the feed. Yeah. So. And wa- hey, watch this. And this is what's really amazing about this sort of situation. Ben the Baptist is trying to, you know, monopolize the feed and do all this. Watch this. Hide user. You're gone. Um, <laughs> gone. Bye, Ben the Baptist. Um, so praise God for, for that little tool there. Um, tool and, for tools. And you'll never be seen. You'll never be seen again. Um, so, but please feel free to uh, message us at, uh, what's the, what's the contact at apologia studios.com studios. contact at apologia studios.com organize something. We'll put you on the program, but I will just say this. You have to behave yourself and act like a Christian. Uh, so, all right, uh, here we go. Let's do this. Let's talk. Um, cool. R- but not before this, not before this. We need a little bit of this to start with. <laughs> of course. This is a really terrible Santa Claus. <laughs> it's our it's our favorite it's time of year. Technology. It's our favorite time of year, Christmas time. We love Christmas at Apologia Church, and um, yeah. So I thought I loved Christmas before I came to this church, but and now I was wrong. you know we do it to the extreme. Right. You know so. what stinks about doing the this live thing where we can't. Um, we have to use royalty-free stuff. We can't play all of our favorite Christmas I know. clips. I know. That's why I have to play this cheesy Christmas music, because yeah. I have to do royalty-free stuff yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. We haven't been able to play any... Our clips from our favorite movies? Yeah, I know. All That's those like things. what we do. Yeah, and because every time we play like a little clip, we get like a ding from YouTube. It's like, hey, naughty... You took a piece. You're of, on the naughty you, know, list. you took a piece of a movie, and we have to debate movie. debate with them and argue with them. Hey, so Merry That's Christmas, everybody! Fun. Enjoy these next couple of weeks for the glory of God. Celebrate God becoming a man. Yes. It's an amazing, amazing thing. All right, let's do this. So, if you guys watched last week's episode, you saw that we played some portions, little clips from Brother MacArthur talking with Ben Shapiro about just a host of different issues, Israel. Jesus mm-hmm. as Messiah, just a lot of stuff. And again, we really, really, as we said last week, appreciate Brother MacArthur. I believe that Brother MacArthur actually led me to Christ in terms of uh, me fully understanding the gospel, the call to come to Jesus, put your faith in him. So we love MacArthur. So our critique here is in no way at all uh, to try to create you know, enemies or conflict. It's just to say as brothers, we think that there's a more appropriate and biblical way to answer an Orthodox Jew or a person who holds to that um, than, than some of these answers that, that came. So um, mm-hmm. what we thought would actually be helpful is we said this. Um, MacArthur is a solid man of God, and he knows the Word of God. He is he's Trinitarian. He believes in justification through faith alone, the, the final resurrection and judgment and all that stuff. He believes in the inerrancy of the Scripture. So all, all that's you know important, and, and that's what he believes. Mm. Um, but on the issue of justice and righteousness in the world, the Messiah's role of actually transforming the world and justice and the law of God permeating all of life, um, he has an eschatological belief system, a view on the end times, eschatology, that actually forced him to answer some of these questions in an inconsistent way. Mm. So in some, in some instances, you would hear him literally talking out of both sides of his mouth because he wanted to be consistent as a Christian— because he is a solid believer in the Lord. He knows the word of God. So he would answer one way, and you'd say, praise God. And then his eschatology would force him to answer in a completely different way in terms of like, no, Jesus isn't really concerned with justice and righteousness and political stuff in this world. But what we were saying, and you're going to hear it in just a second here, what we were saying is that when you divide the, or sorry, when you truncate the gospel like that, and you really dismiss the gospel of the kingdom Mm -hmm. out of your message— you actually feed an Orthodox Jew reasons to reject Jesus mm. that they ought not have. Right. And all of that is not because of the scriptures, it's because of tradition and eschatological views and things like that. So what we're saying is that some of the things that MacArthur was saying, Brother MacArthur was saying to Shapiro, actually let, can lead to Shapiro saying, and that's fine, that's why I reject Jesus as the Messiah. Right, right. Now, I said that. I did. I said that. And uh, this is something that I've been involved in in a long time. And, and, and by gr- the grace of God, I've been able to hear and listen to Jews talk and, and, and to understand some of these eschatological questions. And so, I, you know, I've, I've been there for a long time. And um, maybe some of you guys didn't quite understand what we were saying. And then, lo and behold, I find an amazing clip of Michael Shermer, a well-known atheist, um, discussing the issue of Jesus as Messiah with Ben Shapiro. How do you like them apples? I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. So I found the portion of this discussion where they literally talk about this subject. Yeah. And so what I thought we would do is just today, short episode, we'll just play through some of this, 
We'll answer with the Word of God, and then hopefully the Daily Wire will organize a little discussion between Jeff Durbin and Ben Shapiro <laughs> on meet Jesus and Messiah. <laughs> a little meet and greet. Hey, I'll, I'll pay for dinner, Ben. You know, I'll buy dinner for you and I. We could sit down. Why don't we sit down in a coffee shop? You know what be really cool is if Ben and I could sit down in a coffee shop, and we could just we could a talk. Kosher this. coffee shop. I'll even do that. I'll even do that. Maybe we have some bagels and lox. Is lox and bagels kosher? Yeah. It is? I think. I'm not really a fan of salmon. That's salmon, right? Yeah, it's salmon. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of fish. I'll eat you could have else. some. You could <laughs> share, share some Hebrew national hot dogs. Are those kosher? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got the That's little why it's Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. On that note. On that note. <laughs> way let's way off track. Sorry. Hey. Tell me when to stop, when you want me to stop. Okay. All right, here we go. And Ben Shapiro, oh, that's going to be really loud. I'll fix that for you guys. Ben Shapiro and Michael Shermer, atheist. Here we go. I'll push you on something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my Christian friends and people that I debate, particularly on the resurrection, you know, they have a whole series of arguments. You know, if you just followed our reason, you would accept Jesus as your Savior. And my answer to this is the great... Jewish rabbis who are smarter than you and I sitting here, they've gone through all these arguments. Why, why don't they accept Jesus? Why don't you accept Jesus as the Messiah? Uh, uh, for, pause. i got to say this. From Michael Shermer's perspective, um, he's an atheist. So what's important mm -hmm. to, to note in that discussion is that I would argue that uh, Shermer at that point is actually borrowing from a biblical worldview in order to make sense of his place in the world at the moment. So for here's what I mean by that. Here's a man who believes that his ancestors were fish. Here's a man who believes that he's a descendant of uh, highly evolved societies of bacteria. Here's a man who believes that there is nothing above us but sky, nothing transcendent, nothing ultimately. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I think he's a naturalistic materialist, but if he isn't, this wouldn't apply. But if he is a naturalistic materialist, he would believe that there is not anything beyond the natural world itself. So that mm -hmm. means nothing supernatural mm -hmm. above nature or immaterial or transcendent. Yeah. He believes that all that exists is a material world, right? And all he, all that exists is that around us, what you can taste, touch, smell, weigh, you know, all that stuff and uh, see. Uh, but he also believes that there was nothing in terms of um, the naturalism part of his beliefs. Um, there's nothing um, ultimately governed, right? Right. It was purposeless um, in that sense. And so Here's a man who believes all that, who believes that he's an African ape, that Shapiro's an African ape in front of him, that all of us are random results of a cosmos that didn't have us in mind, right? We're all mm -hmm. accidents of the universe. All that exists is sound and fury signifying nothing. Thank you, Shakespeare, for that delicious quote. <laughs> um, and, uh, and here he is talking about truth. Yeah, like it matters. Like it matters. Yeah, right. Like there's something true, and that matters. Yeah. Or reason and logic. Or there are guys who are really intelligent, really intelligent African apes. Like you're acting like there's something transcendent. You're acting like there's an objective standard outside of all of us, something that we can you know strive for and learn and gain and understand. You're acting like laws of logic are real entities like laws of logic are immaterial abstract universal invariant truths like we ought to actually hold to these things and things have to be logical they have to make sense and these rabbis man they're smarter than all of us man they really apply those laws of logic really where are those at yeah. where do those exist mm -hmm. can you Somewhere... touch one can you taste one right can you smell how one? much yeah. does the law of non-contradiction weigh mr Shermer? uh where can i find it taste it touch it smell it uh, feel it where is the law of logic is it universal is it unchanging does it apply everywhere at all times or is it something only happening in human brains if it's only happening in human brains then you're talking about biochemical responses happening in the brain which means what's happening in your brain right now is not what's happening in my brain because we are not having the same brain experience which means that all it is is biochemical responses and brain fizz and you don't get truth from brain fizz and if you say well, no, these are conventions. We decide on these things. Well, then, you know, then that means the next generation can create a convention that says it's perfectly acceptable to contradict yourself. And that's the new standard for laws of logic, which means that your laws of logic are not even objective or true or necessary or unchanging, which means, Michael Shermer, you just displayed that you're in the image of God and you're borrowing from a Christian worldview in order to make sense of your world and to live in God's world. Did you okay. get that? Did you get all that? All that. <laughs> all right, so that was just to start, and now let's go to Shapiro. Okay, so the, the reason that I don't accept Jesus as the Messiah is because I think that a lot of the arguments in faith, so Jesus as the Messiah is a different figure than anything that exists inside Judaism. So when people say that the, the Judaism predicts the, the coming of Christ, 
the, the change in the nature of what Christ is, what a Messiah would be, is different from Judaism to Christianity. So Judaism never posited that there would be God come to form in physical form, come to earth in physical form, and then okay. you know acting out in the world in in that way. Maybe so, we could start there. Yeah, start yeah. there. So it starts with, and I'll just say this: when you say, that, when uh, Ben, when you say Judaism doesn't posit, well, what I would say is, well, what definition of Judaism are you are you appealing to at that point? Mm. Because if you're appealing mm. to the Judaism given to us, if you mean by that the Judaism given to us in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the in what we would call the Old Testament scriptures. If that's your definition of Judaism, like the text of the Torah and the Tanakh, that's Judaism proper. Mm -hmm. Then I would absolutely say, let's go to that text and let's get into the word. And I will show you that it does, it most certainly does without question, show us that God would become a man to save his people from their sins and to bring his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else. However, if you're using a different definition of Judaism in terms of you're using the commentaries of the rabbis, if you're using the commentaries of the rabbis and discussions, say, before Christ or post-Christ, Jesus Christ, um, then I would say, well, obviously. I mean, we, we know that the Jew Jewish rabbis, you know, rejected Jesus. They called him a bastard, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I, I understand that. But see, that I, I don't want to get to that definition of Judaism. I want to say that the question is, what does the Torah say? Right. What's the Tanakh say? Because that's hmm. the foundation, no matter what we have to say here, the foundation of the, even that other version of Judaism, like the commentaries of the rabbis and the interpretations and those sorts of that tradition, that comes from Torah, Tanakh. So that's where we have to go to is that we have to go to the, that standard and ask the question, did the Hebrew God actually tell us, foretell us, uh, that the Messiah was in fact going to be the God-man? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to find out. So mm -hmm. the law and the prophets essentially the is what we have to go to. Yeah. I think you, you springboard off a of the, the premier text at the beginning of the episode was oh, yeah. the child uh, born, the son to be given, the government being upon his shoulders, and yeah. he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, and in the Hebrew is El Gibor, the Mighty God. That's a title of God attributed to Yahweh, yeah. uh, the Lord, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end, talking about the kingdom and the reign of the Messiah yeah. spreading throughout all the earth. Also, if you go to uh, Micah chapter 5, you see a wonderful, wonderful promise in verse uh, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Judaism posits that God, sorry, is, yeah. of, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, That's whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, unfortunately, the translation doesn't really do justice to how awesome that is, but literally the one whose comings and goings are from eternity. Mm -hmm. right. So the one who was there in eternity past, that's the one coming to Bethlehem. Yes. Right? So right. Just... by the way, where was Jesus born? <laughs> Bethlehem. <laughs> right. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Uh, so that, 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 that's critical. One thing that uh, if you didn't catch it, I want you to please hear this is that in Isaiah chapter 9, this is not just like this verse that just sort of exists, sort of suspended in the middle of a text, like right. it just sort of appears right. out of nothing. Uh, just a quick run through, quick, I'm going to do as fast as possible. If you look at Isaiah chapters 1 and 2, it's God, in, in, his indictment upon his people for not preserving justice, not establishing justice. He tells them, you need to correct oppression. Mm -hmm. You need to cease to do evil, learn to do good. He says, come to me, I'll forgive you, though your sins are as scar uh, scarlet, be white as snow. And it's all, listen, it's all under the discussion of injustice and evil in the world and God's people doing nothing about it. Yes. And then, lo and behold, the glorious text in Isaiah chapter 2 that says that the God himself will draw the nations up to his mountain. Very symbolic language there. It goes, by the way, water doesn't go up. Water goes down. So Isaiah gives you this picture of water being sucked up to God's mountain as the nations are pulled up to God's mountain. The nations, not just Israel, not just the tribes, the nations, Jews and Gentiles coming up the mountain of God. And it says that God's Torah, his mm. law, would go forth from Zion, the place of the people of God. It would go forth from that. So you see like God saying, you're not oppressing, uh, you're, not, you're not stopping injustice and oppression, but my Messiah is going to bring the nations and the law 
is going to go forth into the world. And then it moves on again, and it goes into Isaiah chapter 8, and you get this pattern prophecy there of the virgin conceiving with child, Emmanuel, God with us. Seven. Isaiah 7. 7, sorry, 7. By the way, that, of course, yep. is a particular prophecy that's not a, we wouldn't call that a predictive prophecy. We would call that a pattern right. prophecy uh, that points to Jesus. It's very symbolic. It's very powerful, by the way. God with us, virgin, conceiving. But then you get into Isaiah 9, and now you have God sort of responding to what he said was going to take place, injustice, unrighteousness, sin, evil, all these things. And God's going to bring his Messiah. The nations are going to come up. But listen, then it says that watch what God's going to do. God is going to come himself as a son yeah. and as a child. Mm -hmm. Please hang on to that. Ben, if you're listening, my friend, please hear that. Isaiah 9, long before Jesus comes to the earth, we're talking about like we're talking about over 600 years before Jesus comes to the earth in his earthly ministry. You've got the Jewish prophet saying in, in, in no unclear terms that a son, that's a human, and a child, a human, is going to come and be given to us, and then all of the names of Yahweh are attached to the Son. Mm -hmm. Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father. The word there in the Hebrew, if you look this up, is always that word there of Father is not speaking of like Heavenly Father, right. the Father in Heaven, but of Creator, yeah. the Father of Eternity, yep. the One who is over all eternity. He is coming as a Son, as a man. But here's what's glorious. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there'll be no end. So here's his kingdom that's going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it. And here's what MacArthur needs to hear. With justice yes, yes. and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Now, for all of you guys who are hanging in the background, brothers and sisters who are saying, well, isn't that coming in the future? Like Jesus is going to do that later. We're going to talk about that. Jesus says that he brought the kingdom. Paul yeah. says that he brought the kingdom. And the Bible teaches very clearly that the Messiah's kingdom, Daniel 2, would come during the time of the fourth kingdom. And that is from Babylon. Babylon. It lands on Rome. And lo and behold, Jesus comes in during the Roman kingdom, the fourth kingdom, saying the kingdom of God has arrived. It's here at the fingertip reach. So um, what's important here to note is that the kingdom of God, as it arrives into history, is going to grow and increase. And God himself, as a son and as a child, coming into the world, is going to establish justice and righteousness. Anything, uh, no, say? And it's great. I was just going to say, and not only that, you quoted the, the promise from Daniel 2 about the timing of Messiah's coming. Yeah. But fast forward over to Daniel 9 and the 70 yeah, weeks prophecy too, and talks about how he's going to be the anointed one. Essentially, he's going to be cut off. He's going to die a violent death. Yes. And then after that is the destruction of the temple yep. Yep. that comes. So, so it had to be him. So the question ultimately, like Luke was saying, is, I mean, that temple's gone. Right. It's gone now. So if Jesus was not the Messiah, then who is? Right. He did die a violent death. He was right. cut off. He was sacrificed. He was the offering given for sins. And then the temple was destroyed. Yeah. So if there is no Messiah, now he's not coming. Yeah. That's right. He ain't exactly. coming. Exactly. So that's the point. And this is what I would want to try to impress upon my Orthodox Jewish friends and, and Ben, is if Jesus isn't the Messiah, there is no Messiah. Right. If Jesus isn't the Messiah, nobody can possibly fit any more into it because Daniel chapter 9, no matter how you interpret the 70 weeks prophecy, no matter how complicated the timeline is, I think you could show that it actually lands on Jesus, and I won't do that today. It's too long of a discussion. Yeah. It doesn't matter, though, because what, what does matter is that Daniel is told that the purpose of the 70 weeks prophecy is to make an end of sin. Yep to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to anoint the most holy. These are important messianic things. And it says that the Messiah, the Prince, the, the, the Messiah, the Prince is going to be cut off. And then it says that the second Jewish temple is going to be destroyed. Well, that's done. Mm -hmm. That's 70 AD. Mm -hmm. right. It was a tragic, awful, awful thing. Historically. Historically. Yeah. And if Jesus isn't the one who was cut off before the destruction of that temple, who died the violent death that was predicted, then there is no Messiah. And what's important is this is all from the Torah, right? This is all from the law and the prophets. This is all Old Testament. This isn't anything from the New Testament. And so that's 
that's why it's so important to, yeah. to point this out to to a Jew. Yeah, and and, and and when and when you talk about a different scheme between Judaism, believe me, the reason I trust and have given my life to Jesus as the, my Messiah, my <clears throat> Lord, my God, the one that I am fully invested in and trusting in with my everything, uh, the my the Savior of my soul, the reason is not because very fanciful arguments from the New Testament or from Christians, or just wishful thinking, the reason I am a Christian in terms of the root of my confidence mm. is from the Torah and the Tanakh. The Old Testament is what convinces me that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything you need to know about Jesus as Mashiach, to know him as Savior and as Lord, is found in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. the, the New Testament only amplifies it. Yes. And so uh, I give another example here. When, when you talk about, like, you know, nothing about in the Bible about God sort of like you know, appearing as a man or taking on human form, I would say you got to go back to the Torah and the Tanakh because I, do, I can't even have time in today's episode to go through all the texts about the angel of the Lord. Mm. The angel of the Lord text from the Old Testament. Mm. My friends, the angel of the Lord is clearly Yahweh, mm. is, is clearly the Lord. A couple examples. Um, uh, the angel of the Lord, Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. The angel of the Lord, mm -hmm. the messenger yep. of Yahweh, appeared to him in a blaze of fire. By the way, this is really important, too. we got to get this right, because this, this is an error we make at times. We see a word, and we have association with that word, and so like we, we see angel, and we see start thinking of like, and, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 like, like, like yep. cherubim and seraphim, like before the throne. Like, there's a difference between an angelic creature and... And the angel of the Lord, the messenger, messenger yeah. of the Lord, uh, the messenger of Yahweh appears to him in a blazing fire. We know who was God, God. But this is the angel of the Lord. Another example is um, Exodus you know, three, read two through six, and you'll see that discussion. Or how about um, uh, Genesis sixteen seven through eight? The angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness. It's the messenger of the Lord. Uh, you have another example. I'm just going to run through a few here because there's just, goodness, there's so many. Here's one powerful one. Genesis chapter 19. Mm. Uh, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. This is Sodom and Gomorrah, and you have the two angels show up. But here's what, it's some interesting language happens here in, in, in uh, Genesis where it says, um, oh man, this is so cool. Yeah. Uh, Genesis, it's, uh, I'm sorry, guys, I missed that. 19.23. The sun had risen on the earth when the lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord, Yahweh, rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from Yahweh yeah. out of heaven. Yeah. So you have, wow. you have Yahweh raining sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. <laughs> but there's only one God. There is only one God. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. one. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Only one being of God. And yet in the Old Testament, before we have any understanding of Jesus coming and, and all these things, and we see these dis this distinction in persons happening. And Yahweh even, raining down from Yahweh? Yeah. From heaven, yeah. And you've got the Lord said to my Lord, mm. "Sit in my right hand, so I make enemies a footstool for your feet." Psalm chapter two, beautiful Psalm, where it says, um, uh, in, "In Psalm chapter two, uh, you have God saying, "Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the very ends of the earth for your possession." This is a distinction between persons in terms of we would say the Father and the Son. The Father speaking to the Son, saying, "Obey the Son, or you'll perish, kings of the earth." So there's clearly a distinction in person happening. And then, of course, and this is a beautiful one. I got to say it real fast. And I know Luke's about to say something. Yeah. In Genesis, the beautiful text in Genesis between Abraham and Isaac. Oh, man, it's my favorite. It's my favorite pattern prophecy from the Old Testament. It gives me goosebumps. You have Abraham, the father of our faith, and his son Isaac. It says he's the son of the promise, the son of his love. It says Yahweh tells him, go and you take your son Isaac and you sacrifice him on the place that I'll tell you. It's a three-day journey to get to this place, Mount Moriah. And they get to it three days. It wasn't like, go over there, kill your son. Mm. Go to this specific spot with your son Isaac, the son of your love, your only son. And you give him there as a sacrifice to me. So they get all the way to that place three days later. With the wood the, on his back. And right. then Isaac carries his son, his only son, the son of his love, carries the wood of the sacrifice to the place of the sacrifice. Oh, that's so awesome. 
and they get there and Isaac's like, father, I'm like, here's the fire. Here's this. But like, where's the lamb? Mm. Where's the mm. lamb? And Abraham, the father of our faith says, God will provide for himself, the yep. lamb, my son. And so he binds Isaac, his son, the son of his love, who carried the wood to the place of the sacrifice onto that altar. And then he raises his knife and who comes to stop him? Malak Yahweh. It says the angel of the Lord tells him to stop. And what does he say in terms of who is the angel of the Lord who materializes and appears? Essentially, he's there appearing to him, talking to him. And he says, the angel of the Lord says to him, you haven't withheld your only son from me. The angel of the Lord? You haven't withheld your son from me? I thought that Abraham was offering his son to Yahweh. And yet the angel of the Lord saying, you haven't withheld him from me. And then they see a ram caught in a thicket of the bush. Not a what? Not lamb. a lamb. A ram. And they offer the ram. And then Abraham says, this is the mount the Lord will provide it. And it was about 2,000 years later that the son of God's love, his only son, his eternal son, carried the wood to the place of the sacrifice. And where was it? That yep, place. place. And what did God not do there? He didn't withhold his hand mm. to sacrifice his son in that place. Wow. But when you say to me, like, the, the, by, you know, Judaism knows nothing about God becoming a man, you know, God materializing, you know, taking human form. It's like... Ben, I love you, man, but do you Bible? Like, it's, it's right there. Like, it's in the text. That's what we're going to. Christians, Christians, my friend, are not going to the New Testament and sort of like fanciful theological footwork saying, let's just make a creative story. The early Jews who turned to Jesus as Messiah were doing so on the basis of the scriptures of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Acts, these are all Jewish Christians. Mm -hmm. It says in Acts chapter 9 that Paul is going to the synagogue and he's reasoning from the scriptures proving that Jesus is Messiah. From the scriptures, the most beautiful Bible study to have ever been involved in would have been that day after Jesus rose again. They were on the road to Emmaus and these Jewish disciples are freaking out. They're like, oh, we thought he was Messiah. We thought he was this and that. He's dead now. And, and Jesus is like walking alongside them. And he's like, are you so slow to believe all that the scriptures have written? And then Jesus, the Messiah, takes them through the Old Testament, all the places the Old Testament told about Jesus. That's a Bible study that I wish I was a part of. I wish I was a part of that Bible study. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I was just going to say briefly, you're when you were talking about, you know, Yahweh and Yahweh, um, you know, obviously in Genesis one, you have, um, and God created heavens and the earth, God there being Elohim, which of course is plural. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? And then later on in verse 26, you know, it's God, God says, Elohim says, let us make man in our image. Yeah. yeah. You know, so like it just more, more old Testament, uh, language that points to, a distinction in persons. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. A distinction in persons. All right. Um, so more to do. I know we're trying to go faster, guys. Please forgive me for my rapid fire today, guys. I'm just trying to get this episode done because we have to leave and do some stuff for end abortion now. I'm doing my best. Okay, here we go. On space and time, occasionally he intervenes in history, but he doesn't take physical form. It's one of the key beliefs of Judaism, actually, is an right. incorporeal mm -hmm. God. No, it's not. No, it's not. If you read the Torah and the Tanakh, you actually have plenty of examples of God literally taking on human form. I seem to remember somebody wrestling with God. <laughs> I seem to remember somebody, one of our heroes, Jacob, wrestling with God. Now, I, that, mm. is that in the book of Matthew or Galatians? <laughs> Where's that at? Genesis. Book of Revelation? Oh, that was in Genesis. Oh, that's called the Torah. Ben. Ben, come to Jesus. You've got to come to Christ. He's the Messiah. You are so brilliant, Ben. Listen, the only thing that separates any of us from God ultimately is our sin. We're all fallen. We're all corrupt. We all get things wrong. The, the, you can't reject Jesus because of, quote, Judaism or the Old Testament. You can only turn to Jesus because of the Old Testament and Judaism, the tr real Judaism, like the real, real deal. Um, uh, man, the, Ben, that's just, that's just too easy. You know that. You, you are a lot smarter than me, Ben. You are definitely a lot smarter than me. And you should know better than to say that God wouldn't materialize or appear because you know all about God wrestling mm. with Jacob. You know all about it. And also so, known as Israel. That's right. That's right. Uh, so that means that it's it's a the the idea is is actually foreign to Judaism of of a merged God man. Uh, Isaiah nine, Micah five two, we could we could go on just describing this, but uh, that's not true. It's not foreign to Judaism, unless and that's why I tried to make the distinction there. 
That's really important. Unless what you mean by Judaism, Ben, is the Judaism of the Jewish commentaries, the rabbis' commentaries, um, rabbinic tradition. If that's what you mean by Judaism, okay, but that doesn't make it biblical. I mean, we're talking about what does the Word of God say? What's the Torah and the Tanakh say? I want to know what the Torah says. I want to know what the Tanakh says. I want to know what that says, because these rabbis disagree with each other back and forth. And by the way, to be fair, so do Christians. Christians will disagree back and forth. I mean, I'm doing a show today talking about how I disagree with some of the things my brother John MacArthur said. So Christians have disagreements back and forth. So where do you go for solace? Where do you go for objective truth in that standard? You go to the revelation of God himself. The source. Yeah. The source. God spoke. So what did God say to Moses? That's what I want to know. What did God say to Isaiah? That's what I want to mm. know. What did he say to Ezekiel? That's what I want to know. That's the Judaism I want to get back to. If we're talking about real Judaism, that's what I want to get to. Uh, who then is who is God in physical form, but then dies and is resurrected and all this. This is it's a, it's just a different idea than exists in Judaism. So you're not if you mean Judaism of the rabbinic commentaries, but if you mean the Judaism of the Old Testament, then let's start. Let's figure that out. Um, how about in Isaiah chapter nine, the text we already brought up? You have the Messiah, the Prince, Messiah, the Prince who comes. Well, that's who's that? Who's Messiah, the Prince? Uh, Messiah the Prince. <laughs> Messiah the Prince is, um, well, he's the same one that's in Daniel chapter 7. So Daniel 9 one way to says, respond. Daniel 9 says Messiah the Prince comes and he's cut off. Well, that word is used in the Old Testament to describe a violent death, like sacrifices. So Messiah the Prince comes to make atonement for iniquity. He's cut off. He dies a violent death. And then the second Jewish temple is going to be destroyed. Again, 70 AD. It's done. It's over, Ben. So if he's not the Messiah, there is no Messiah because there ain't no more second temple. It's gone. <laughs> uh, but if you look in Daniel chapter 7, who is Messiah the Prince? He's the one who's actually seated next to Yahweh. He's the one who's being worshipped. Well, you can only worship God. What's Messiah the Prince doing taking a throne and actually being worshipped? There are thrones in Daniel 7, and the Messiah is on one of them, and he's receiving worship. So when you talk about like, you know, there's nothing in, in Judaism about the Messiah being worshipped and God and those sorts of things, I would say, again, let's check out our Old Testament. Let's look at our mm. Torah on Tanakh. Yep. Mm. Yep. Anything else? No, I mean, it's I know we're good, I know we're Russian. We're getting to the end. Discussion. Waiting yeah. for the Messiah. Oh, 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 oh. I, I forgot. Um, I'm not even bringing up, of course, the one you know, Ben. Of course, I know you, you have Christians bring this up to you. But when you talk about like nothing about him dying and rising again, I would say, ooh, not true either. Just the Old Testament. How about Isaiah chapter 53? Yeah. Isaiah 53. We've got a copy of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls that predate Christ. And so we've got Isaiah 53 in that text. Mm -hmm. And in that text, long before Jesus comes, Isaiah 53, it talks about the Messiah. And they thought he was being punished for his own sins, but Yahweh was laying on him the iniquity of us all. Well, you've got Yahweh laying on this one, the sins of God's people. And if somebody says, well, no, that's just a way of, it's a, a roundabout way of describing Israel. It couldn't be. It could not be. Because it very clearly says in Isaiah 53, he had done no deceit. There was no violence, no, no. violence, no deceit in his mouth. Had Israel done violence? Does Israel have deceit in their mouths? Of course. So that can't be Israel. And it clearly says in Isaiah 53 that they were going to think he was dying for his own sins, but he was dying for the sins of God's people. He'd be pierced through for our transgressions, yeah. crushed for our iniquities, a chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And it says Yahweh was pleased to crush him, yeah. putting him to grief. He would justify the many as he'd bear their iniquities. But it does say this, he'd be counted among the rebels. Who did Jesus die with? The criminals, the rebels. Who did Jesus die for? Who was he counted as? A sinner, a rebel. And then it says what? After, he's, after he dies in Isaiah 53, it says very clearly that he will actually tell of God's name yeah. to his brethren. Well, I thought he died. What's he doing now telling about God to his mm. brethren? So he'll see his offspring. He'll prolong his days is actually that, that particular verse. He'll see his offspring. He will prolong his days. He dies, and yet he sees his offspring and prolongs his days. It's all in a text, Ben. It's all there in the Old Testament. It is a powerful, powerful thing to have the Word of God speaking to us about Mashiach, about the Messiah. And, and, and I, I want to say, and we'll, you know what? I'm going to actually leave it to this section because it's going to come up right here. This is where we need to talk about it.
to come. Right. He's not coming in the in So the, the I'm waiting form. I'm waiting for Messiah to come in the form of a political figure, right? Remember I said that? Whew. Remember I said that yep. that MacArthur's and some of you guys maybe didn't believe me. And so I I hope you'll you know just give me just a moment here. Do you hear that? That is one of the key reasons besides of course human sin and rebellion, but in terms of argumentation um, that's one of the key reasons Orthodox Jews Jews reject Jesus as Mashiach. Why? Because Christians give them an excuse to. Why? Because we say things like, eh, Jesus didn't bring his kingdom. Not really. It's coming later. He's not concerned with justice. He'll do all the that. political stuff that you guys expected of him later. Yeah. The justice and the righteousness, the peace increasing in the earth. That'll come someday later. And so the Jews goes, then he's not the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, tell us why. I mean... Psalm 22, I mean, the Passion Psalm of the Messiah just mimics perfectly what Isaiah 53 says in terms of his death, his, his piercing, his hands and his feet. Um, the fact that all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. The families of the nations are going to come back to worship, to worship God. God. The posterity shall serve him. His posterity shall serve him. How is he going to have a posterity when he's laid in the dust of death? Yeah, mm -hmm. right? that's right. That's right. So um, another passage that we quote all the time, mm -hmm. Isaiah 42, yeah. about the Messiah bringing justice this is important can we do that let's yeah. do it yeah go ahead and, and, and read it because this it. is what you all need to hear because listen I, here's i love brother, brother, brother macarthur i love you so much you are such a gift to god's church but the, listen do you hear what ben sh said there yeah. he said in in judaism the messiah is has p a political component to himself an issue of justice and righteousness and you know what let me say this ben you're right yes ben 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 you are right 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 you are absolutely right the messiah is supposed to have a political component to himself in terms of righteousness and justice and the law of God in the world and bringing peace. You are absolutely right. And I want to say this, and that's precisely what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't do it. Um, he doesn't do it sort of uh, from military might. He does it through the transformation yep. of the person, mm -hmm. through the good news, through salvation. He changes human beings. He draws the nations. And as people love and worship the Lord God of Israel because of Jesus. They now love his law. They love justice. They love righteousness. And then that begins to permeate around the earth. But listen to that text, Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. So the a bruised so the reed Messiah. he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice where in the earth in the, yep. in the earth and yeah. the coastlands yeah, wait for his law the farthest reaches of civilization where there are no people that's mm -hmm. where jesus is bringing his light and his justice they, yeah. they, they wait for his torah yeah. his law mm -hmm. his law it's powerful mm -hmm. and you know one of the things that's important to to grapple with about the message of jesus is when jesus came into the world he didn't have the truncated gospel that many evangelicals have right. today in terms of it's just about going to heaven one day. Uh, that's a truncated gospel. Is it true that we get eternal life and go to heaven one day? Yes. But that wasn't the sum and substance of Jesus' message. What did Jesus say to pray about? Our Father who art in heaven, your name may your holy. name be holied around the world. Well, that would seem to mean societal transformation. Right. <laughs> if, if Jesus tells you, the Messiah tells you to pray that God's name would be holied throughout the world, then that would mean the world needs to be changed, mm. right? Because yeah. they're not now right. completely. Right. Um, and then when he says, uh, name be holy, he says, um, your kingdom. will be done. Kingdom come. Your kingdom yeah. come. Your rule come. Let it come. And he says, and let your will be done here yep. on earth. Yep. How? Just how much? Well, the same way that it is in heaven. So just how much is God obeyed in heaven? Perfectly. So what does Jesus tell us to pray for? That the way that God is obeyed and his will is done in heaven, that that's how it'd be done here. Mm. Well, that's what Jesus tells us all to pray about. So when you say like, eh, you know, Jesus, he's different than the Judaism and ours is more of a political, you know, righteousness, justice ruler. Well, I would say, Ben, read Jesus' words. That's what he's talking about. The rule of God, the kingdom of God, justice, righteousness, the will of God here in this life, in this world. I want to say this, Ben, if you're watching this, um, listen, one of the, the struggles that we've had within Western Christianity, please hear me on this. One of the struggles we had in Western Christianity is we've had truncated versions of the gospel of the kingdom. We've actually in many ways distorted the message of Jesus in, in many, many yeah. ways. 
And so we've even lost some of what historic Christianity and early Jew, Jewish followers of Jesus would have been saying and doing in the name of Jesus in the world. And we've truncated it all. And we've basically taken the message of Jesus and we've, we've, we've whittled it down to a few abstract concepts. But we've lost actually what Jesus was preaching, that you would love Ben, that you want, that you want to hear from him in terms of, is he the Messiah? The first thing Jesus does after John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, the first thing Jesus does is he goes to the wilderness, does what Israel failed to do, and it says he comes out proclaiming the good news the of the kingdom, yep. of the kingdom, which has been what you're talking about. When you say political ruler and justice and righteousness and reshaping the world, my goodness, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. But listen, Ben, he wasn't talking about it in terms of military might and fighting. He was talking about it in terms of salvation and peace with God. When we receive peace with God through faith in the Messiah and his work, we receive justification, a declaration of righteousness and peace with God, but we also have been regenerated and changed and made alive with new hearts. And now we love God's law. Mm. We love his justice. Mm. We love his righteousness. And what's amazing, Ben, and Ben, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, but this is important. Ben, you know that in, in history, when, when Christians have come into a culture and civilization, you know that while it's not perfect, Christians haven't been perfect by a long shot, but you have seen that as Christians have come into cultures and societies, they've actually increased the love for God's law, mm -hmm. the love for God's justice, the love for righteousness, and all those things. Like, who's doing the majority of, like, the adoption things in the world with fatherless yeah. children? Is it people that are atheists mm -hmm. or even modern right. Jews? It's actually who, Ben? It's the Christian church. Who, who, who are the ones that have abolished slavery in every single place we've gone in history? Who are the ones that have ended it through the message of the gospel? The Christians. Everywhere we've gone, we've ended slavery, corrected oppression. Now, I'm not saying it's been perfect, and I'm not saying Christians don't have work to do. What I'm saying is, is that that move of the Messiah through his redemption and salvation begins to increase in his government and of peace. And brother, and my friends, there is no end. There is no end to it. Mm -hmm. So, oh man, are we, are we out of time? We're 11 minutes past time. All right. So I hope this has whet your appetite, everybody. Um, yeah. Let me point you to some text to read yeah. about in terms of the Messiah That's himself. Read Isaiah 2. Read Isaiah 11. Read Isaiah 42. Read Isaiah 53. I'm just in Isaiah. We haven't even touched the other books yet. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, except for Daniel. We did some of Daniel. Um, so I want to encourage you to go through those, the Old Testament texts themselves. Please do that. Investigate that. And for Christians, my brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I love with all my heart, who have had an eschatological perspective that puts the kingdom of God somewhere later, just know that not only is that not consistent with the message of Jesus and the apostles, but know that it does damage. It does damage to our witness. Why? Because it's not true. It's not true. Um, Jesus says that he brought the kingdom. He mm. did. He taught that he brought it. Yep. Proof, um, you all know this. Here's one example. Uh, Matthew 12, right? I think it's, uh, it escapes me at the moment. It's, it's either 10, 11, or 12. It's where they say that Jesus is casting out demons. Mm -hmm. That he's casting out demons because he's, you're shacked up with the devil. That's, that's how you're doing it. You're casting out demons because you're working with Satan. That's how you're doing it. So Jesus gives them an if-then. He says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, he says, then, then. the kingdom of God has come upon mm -hmm. you. So question, brothers and sisters, did Jesus cast out demons by the Spirit of God? If you say yes, then then the mm. kingdom of God had come upon them. Also, you, of course, you can see the Apostle Paul saying that God has delivered us out of the domain of darkness, and he's brought us into the kingdom of his Son. Mm. I, we can go on for days. The, Testament, the New Testament itself giving us testimony that the Messiah has brought his kingdom. And if you say, I just don't know about that, <laughs> I would say, well, let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus is king of kings? And if you say yes, you mean that means you believe that he rules now as the king over the kings of the earth. Is he Lord of Lords? And if you say yes, I would say, is that just a pithy statement or do you believe it? Is that just something to put on a t-shirt or do you really believe it? And if you say, well, give me more, Jeff, I would say 1 Corinthians 15. The apostle Paul says that Jesus is on the Davidic throne now. He's not waiting to be installed to the Davidic throne. He's there now. 
And what's he doing? According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he is placing every Mm -hmm. enemy under Mm -hmm. his feet as a footstool for his feet today. So we're not waiting for Jesus to take a seat on the Davidic throne. He, according to the Apostle Paul, through inspiration, is on that throne right now, putting God's enemies under his feet, and the very last enemy to be defeated is death. death. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is on the throne, putting all of his enemies under his feet. I say he's the king that was always promised, but he's not ruling in the way that men would like to Mm -hmm. rule, with military might. Mm -hmm. He's ruling through salvation and redemption. And I, I second li- that. And I like that. Amen. I like that. All right, guys. So this has been Apologia Radio. I want to encourage you all, if you have not signed up for All Access, please do. Yeah. Just know this, that when you sign up for All Access, not only do you get the all that amazing content, uh, Apologia Academy, all that stuff. We have Dr. James White. We have John Sampson. We have... Um, Heavy hitters. Heavy, heavy hitters <laughs> in there for Apology Academies. Um, but we also get all the TV shows, the after shows. You get access to all those. But you also make everything we do possible. Yep. And it's only um, nine ninety five a uh, don- donation a month. Mm-hmm. When you do that, you actually support the work of Apology Church to get the gospel around the world. Um, and so please do. You got anything else you want to say? No, I mean, it's been a great show. I wish we had more time to... Yeah. We're we have just, to... I'm sorry, guys. scraping the service. Yeah, we are. We have to go today, guys, because we are... Um, we have to go film something for end abortion now. So please, please pray for us actually for that. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you all so much for your support this year. It's been a huge blessing to us. We're grateful for you. Go to apologiastudios.com to get more um, content and to sign up for all access. Uh, what else? What else? This what else? is the last uh, show of the I year, think, right? I think it is the last yep. show of the year. If you guys would please pray for band. us because we were going to be launching our end abortion now 2019 stuff in the next uh, couple of days, actually. Uh, please be in prayer for us that God would use that mm-hmm. in a mighty way. He has now brought the message of the gospel against abortion uh, to Southern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Mm. And it's all been through our joint effort. Yep. It's not our yes. thing. It's partnership. people of God doing this together around Jesus and the gospel. By the way, are you ready for this? Because it relates to the Ben Shapiro thing completely. Bringing justice. <laughs> yeah. Do you get that? Do you see it now? It's Jesus and his message and his rule over us that brings about justice increasing in the world. Are you seeing it now? Now, all we need now is to, is for the whole world to come to Jesus, and then everybody will love God's law mm. and his justice and righteousness. And then you have a world that has essentially gone from the garden to the desert back to the garden. Mm. Garden city. <laughs> garden city, baby. All right, y'all. So praise the Lord. That is... Luke the Bear. Peace out and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm Jeff and Happy New Year to you in jail. And that is Zach Attack. Merry Christmas. All right, God bless you guys. Thank you for watching.